Welcome back to Revive School. I'm Sean Carlson. I'm going to hang out with you uh, here still in the book of Hebrews. We're almost done chapter 12 of 13. And uh, today, chapter 12 is going to be just a continuation of what we've been talking about. But the progression of what we've been through in the book of Hebrews is we've gone through this concept of the old covenant versus the new covenant. It's Hebrews is a book written to Hebrews trying to convince them to stop acting like Hebrews. And so stop with the Old Covenant and start with the New Covenant, start with Jesus. And then uh, in chapter 11, we get to walk through the Hall of Faith and like these people who lived by faith. So now that we've taken our eyes off the Old Covenant and we're fixed on Jesus, now we start walking by faith. And then today is a fun chapter for me. It starts off with, with an analogy, almost like a parable, and it's a sports parable. It's, it's about athletics. And uh, as I, I think I said a couple days ago, you know, God deposits his word in our heart. And when you read something, it, there's like, sometimes it just like resonates. This is one of those analogies that resonates with me uh, in sport. Uh, uh, you know, I've run several marathons. I even thought about bringing in my medals today. Uh, I was a ski instructor. And so I've got these different perspectives in regard to sport that I think I can really identify and relate to in this chapter. And, and I, I love that the writer does that and that God does that with scripture. He puts so many things in there that we can relate to. And so I'm excited to draw out some of these analogies and then compare them against the scripture and the verses that we're going to read and see what we're going to learn about God wanting us to today learn about our walk with Jesus. So we've got, we've set aside the old covenant. We're focused on Jesus. We're going to live by faith. And today we're going to talk about our walk, our journey with the Lord. Uh, in, in our lives. And, and I think it's all about this concept of life eternal. Uh, Kyle touched on this yesterday. When you walk by faith, it's an adventure. And, and living a life eternal here on earth with Christ at the center of it is just like an abundant life. There's so much to it. And you get so much joy and fulfillment out of it when you walk with the Lord as your guide. And so I think that's what we're going to get into today. And we're going to see that. And, and, and it's going to be talking about endurance. So before we get into the text, I actually want to kind of set up the sport analogy that I believe that they're referencing. And, and we've, we've got a picture here that Kevin's going to put up. Uh, the sport that we're going to talk about and reference a lot uh, is running. And so I want to set up running back in the ancient Olympics. This, it was called a stadion. And so this is a, a, a picture of a stadion and what it would look like. And in the early days of the running sport, they would really just run from one end to the other. So they'd run from here to here. They'd run about 180 meters, which is about uh, a little under two football fields or one and a half soccer fields. So that was the goal. That was to just to run that one distance. As the sport developed, they would run, they said, well, if we can do that, why don't we try to do it twice? So they would run down to one end, they would run down here, they'd run around these poles, and then they'd run back. And so that was the competition. It was to run down and run back. And there's some quirky things about this. Number one, they're running on sand. And so it's different from running on a hard ground. If you've ever run like on the beach or in sand in bare feet, it, it's it takes a lot more effort to do it and you have unstable ground underneath your feet. The second quirky thing, in addition to running on sand, is that often they would run these naked. And so like you got the whole dynamic of running this thing naked. I don't know why they did that. I, I read many things that said that's how they did it. Uh, but I believe that there's an analogy in here that will kind of corroborate that. Yeah, don't fall. Yeah, don't fall. That'll hurt. Uh, and then the third thing is that they would eventually run with a lot of people. And so imagine running down here with five, six, seven, eight, I don't know how many people, and you're all trying to get around that pole at one time. And so it's just like this like massing, and don't forget that you're naked. And so like, you're like trying to get around this pole and you're pushing people around. So it's, it's an endurance exercise. Running like this is an endurance exercise. And uh, there's a lot more to running in endurance that we'll, we'll kind of call in here. Uh, but that's kind of the picture that we're going to use as we talk about running this race with endurance throughout this chapter. So uh, let's jump in and see how we can tie some of these parables and these images into the verses here. So in verse 1, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, it says this. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Okay, so things in this, in this verse that we need to unpack. So first of all, therefore. So remember in chapter 11, who did we talk about? Kevin? Rich? 
All those that live by faith and were approved by God because of it. Yeah. So we got this great cloud of witnesses. So therefore, we're connecting to those people who we just got done talking about in chapter 11 who walk by faith. So therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, another way uh, to say that is a, is a great multitude of witnesses. A lot of witnesses who have run this journey before us. Like they get it. They know it. Uh, and then uh, I want to point out the word endurance, uh, which is also in, in this verse here. Endurance means to, uh, to remain in existence. So think about this. As we're walking by faith, there are going to be uh, things that we need to endure. As you're running this race, there are things that you need to endure. You need to endure the sand. You need to endure the, the other people you're running with. We have to survive those things in order to run the race well. And what this verse is saying is that we're, we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses who have endured their race really well. And our goal as believers, as followers of Christ, is to endure our race, the race that is set before us, because God has called us to something. And so that's our goal, is to run the race with endurance. I want to point out one more word. I kind of did this backwards, but the, the, the cloud of witness. So witness, uh, we, we probably have talked about this before. The Greek word that is used for witness is also the same word that is used for martyr. And martyr is somebody, as we know, who is willing to die for what they believe. And I, th I think that when you put witness in that context, or you maybe put it into a courtroom context, a witness is somebody who testifies to a physical reality that they experience themselves. And so... Uh, the, the cloud of witness, they experienced something or they walked by faith and they believed so much that they're probably willing to die for it. That's how much of, the, of what they uh, experienced was truth in their lives. That's how much Jesus is truth in my life that I'm, I'm so sure of it that I'm willing to be so extreme that I might die for it. And so this great cloud of witnesses uh, who are, are, are our example to run this race with endurance, okay? And then we've got this concept of shedding things off. And so uh, we want to set aside every weight. And so if you think about like weight, you know, like if, if, you're, if you're running uh, maybe in the wintertime and you have a lot of uh, layers on because uh, it's cold outside. Well, once spring comes around and you get to shed those and you're just in your shorts and your t-shirt, like you're, you're free. Or like if you're carrying a water bottle, you have weight on you. And it is so much easier to run when you don't have that weight on you. And then the sin which clings so closely. I was trying to think of an analogy, like the sin that clings so closely, like, you know, if you sweat so much that your shirt sticks to you and it's just like uncomfortable, like you just want to shed that stuff off. And the whole point is that because we want to run the race with endurance, we want to walk by faith. We want to run by faith like those who went before us. In verse 2, it says, it continues, the sentence continues, it says, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. And so when we, we take that, that first part of this verse, it says, looking to Jesus. We as, as humans have a tendency <clears throat> to go wherever we're looking. And so think about the people who are running down this track. They're looking straight at this pole. They're looking straight at these concrete pillars because that's the quickest and the fastest way to where they're going is to look straight ahead. For us, we need to be looking at Jesus, who's the author, the perfecter of our faith. If we want to run the race with endurance, we cannot be distracted to the left or to the right. We want to go straight ahead. And it's a natural tendency, uh, either when you're running, uh, you know, in downhill skiing, or even when you're driving, wherever your head goes is where your body tends to go. And so if you're going to look to the left or to the right, guess what? There's a good chance that you're going to drift to the left or you're going to drift to the right. And so we need to be looking at Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, so that we know that the race that we're running is the race that we are running. Like we are running straight ahead, pursuing it with endurance. Because Jesus, with joy, ran the race that was before him. What was Jesus' end destination on this earth? Cross. was the cross. He looked at the cross. He knew when he came here, he knew exactly what his role was. He knew the race that he had to run. And he did it with joy. And we see in this verse, it says he, he despised the shame. He just, the shame, it's like that, we talked about that shedding. He despised it. He just, he, he, he stripped it away. He sent it away. And then in verse 3, 
It says, Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. Consider him who endured from sinners against himself. He, ha he was so focused on his end goal that he endured pain and affliction from the very people that he was sent to save. He came to die for all of us. And those who were inflicting pain on him, he knew that he was dying for them too. Can you imagine doing for something who was something for somebody who was like beating you? Man, he knew exactly who he was here for. He, he ran his race with endurance. He had his eyes fixed on the concrete pole at the end of the at the end of the track. He had his eyes fixed on exactly what he was supposed to do. And we can look to that and know that somebody else has gone before us to do that so that we don't grow weary or faint-hearted. It, it, it's this expression that, you know, Jesus knows everything that we will go through. Jesus knows every pain that we will have. Jesus will know every temptation that we will have. He knew the greatest, like, punishment for sin that could be. And so we know that whatever we have is going to be in the gap between me and him. Like, he has already done it. It's a mental endurance, just knowing all of these things. And so in verse 4, it says, In your struggle against sin, you have not resisted to the point of shedding of blood. So that's that same point. Like, we have not had to go that far for our struggle, for our race, for our endurance. But he did, and we know that he set the course for us. You know, there's, there's uh, when I was skiing, there's a couple of different coaching styles. I had, I had one coach who was very active in his participation of coaching you. And so if you had a movement that you were trying to figure out, he would get in the, in the race course or he would get on the hill with you and replicate the quote unquote, the bad movement that you were doing so that he knew exactly what you were going through so that he could prescribe or recommend a different movement to get you out into a correct posture. So it was really awesome that he did that because he was doing, he knew exactly what you were going through. And then we had another coach, who's, and both great coaches. We had another coach who just did a lot of coaching. He saw a lot of skiers, uh, and he, he kind of stood at the bottom of the hill and would provide advice and, and coach. And there was just a difference between somebody who was doing it with you, who had done the, kind of the sin or the bad movement that you were doing, and somebody who was just calling it out and identifying it. And Jesus is the one who experienced what we experience. He knows our struggle. Not because he knows all, but because he experienced our struggle while we were here. In verse 5, it says, And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. First of all, right here, do we know that we're sons? Like, do we know that we're sons and daughters of God? That's a, that's a great concept to grasp hold of. But we're going we're gonna to see this play out here. Do you know that you are a son? He addresses you as sons. And then we get this word discipline. Ah, the word discipline. Discipline, it, it means to train. Uh, and, and when it's used in the New Testament, it's always in the context of children, like training up children. Uh, I think sometimes we get caught in this rut of the word discipline in our minds. I think that we think it means punishment. But it really means training. And, and if we think, let's just go to, Kevin, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, and just get this concept of discipline and, and training uh, from some other scriptures. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4, says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So this concept of fathers and sons or parents and children, bringing our children up, training them up in the instruction of the Lord. So there's some, some, some training that we're giving them and then there's a subject that we're giving them training on, which is in this case, the instruction of the Lord. So discipline in the context is in the context of parents and children training up their children in the way that they should go. That's what scripture says. That's what our job is as parents, is train up our children in the way that we should go. One thing about discipline, I was kind of pondering this about like my own, you know, uh, being a father and uh, other kids in my life. I, I like to train my kids. And, and when I see them doing something that I think that they could do better, I will coach them in that. I'll try to raise them up in that. Why? Because I care for them. But there are kids who like maybe live next door and if they do something that I think that they could do better in, I probably don't say very much. Why? 
I don't want to say God as I don't care for them, but they're not my kids. I don't care for them like I care for my kids. And I want to see them do well. And so the whole concept here in discipline and parents and children is that we are sons and daughters of God and God wants to train us up. This race, this endurance, he wants to train us up. So in chapter 12, verse 6, it says this, For the Lord disciplines the ones he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. So if, if you are feeling disciplined by the Lord, Guess what? What does that mean? He loves us. If we're getting disciplined by the Lord, He loves us. Uh, my wife, Erica, uh, she, she was in some prayer time, and the Lord said, I want you to get up at 5.45 in the morning and start praying every day. Just create a discipline of, of praying every single day. And so she did. She was getting up at 5.45. And my wife, she, she's like... she's like the night person. I'm the morning person. She's the night person. And so it's harder for her to get up in the morning. And so 5.45, the alarm goes off, she gets up most days, you know, sometimes it's hard, but she kind of got into the rhythm and the routine of getting up at 5.45 every single day, no problem. So a couple of weeks later, after she's got that down, uh, God speaks to her again and says, all right, now start getting up at 5. And she was like, what, God, I just started getting up at 5.45. I just started doing it. So she started setting her alarm for 5 o'clock. Well, it was a little bit tough for her to get up at 5 o'clock. But guess what? Our one and a half year old, this is the craziest thing, he, if, she, if, if my wife didn't get out of bed and start praying, our one and a half year old started crying at like 4.45, 5 o'clock, 5.15. Like he basically woke her up. And then he, once, once a one and a half year old is up, he's up. But on the mornings where she would wake up at five and, and get out of bed and start praying, he never cried. And we believe wholeheartedly that it, it was the Lord disciplining her, creating a, a routine, a training in her to get up at five. And when she gets up at five, he doesn't cry. So I believe that we experience the Lord's discipline, the Lord's training in something that he wanted us to do, which is her to do, which is to get up and pray. And so we felt loved by the Lord, even though it's like, ah, oh, that alarm, why is it going off? We felt loved by the Lord. We are sons and daughters of him. We received his discipline in verse seven. It says, it is for the discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons for what son is there whom his father does not discipline. Endure it. If you're being disciplined by the Lord, endure it because you know he's getting ready for something great. You know that he's training you and prepping you. He knows you. He knows you when you were in your mother's womb. He knows the hairs on your head. He knows the calling you have on your life. He knows the destiny that's before you. He's getting you ready for what he's calling you to do. So receive the discipline. Receive the training because you have a race that you are going to run, that God has scheduled for you to run. Receive the discipline and the training so that when it's time for you to run your race, when the gun goes off, you can run it with endurance and you can run it well. And verse 8 says, If you are left without discipline, in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. There are, there are uh, things that we discipline our kids with, that we know is good for them. And there are people who we don't discipline or things that we, we maybe just let go in, 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 our, in our kids' lives that maybe we don't have the energy to. And we can see the fruit of that down the road. Like if we don't discipline something, if we don't train them in something, six months, a year down the road, we're like, oh man, this is really causing a problem. Now we need to go back and correct it. And so if we're left without discipline, we're just, it's like we're not being treated like children. And I think the the great, the good father, the awesome father is perfect in his discipline towards us. Are we perfect in receiving the discipline that he has? And in verse 9, it says this. Besides this, we have had earthly fathers who disciplined us and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the father of spirits and live? Like we, we receive a pattern. Part of our pattern as parents of disciplining our children is so that they are accustomed to the process of being disciplined so that when it comes time for the Lord to discipline them, they know that it's okay. They know that we're still going to love them. They know that we have their best interests in mind and they know how to receive it. They know how to respond to the discipline. I, kind of, I think back to when I was running my first marathon. Like there's a, a 16 week, of, uh, you know, like a four month training schedule and like you're doing crazy things in the beginning and you're really getting yourself stretched out. And there are times when you're like, man, is this even going to work? I can never run 26.2 miles. But you have coaches and you have other people in, in, at least in my context, in my running group who had been down that road before. They had gone through the training and they knew that the training was fruitful and they were able to kind of put their arm around you and say, that's all right. 
This, this training is worth it. Everything that we're going to do is going to point towards you crossing that finish line on your feet and celebrating the fact that you just ran a marathon. And so, like, I knew because of the people who had gone before me that the discipline that I was undergoing, that it was going to bear fruit. And I think it's the same thing. Like, we undergo discipline from our earthly parents so that we know that our, our Heavenly Father has a good and perfect plan for us. And in verse 10, it says about our parents, this is the, our fathers, it says, For they disciplined us for a short time, as it seemed best to them, but He disciplines us for our good, that we may share in His holiness. You know, the reality of, of discipline is that it only feels like discipline until it becomes a discipline. In other words, like, <clears throat> the discipline when you're in the training, when you're doing stuff you've never done before, and it's hard, it's going to feel hard. But once you grow those muscles and you develop those muscle memories and those movements, then it becomes normal and then you can incorporate it into your routine. And so I think God is just getting us always, always to where like the discipline and the training becomes the new normal. And in verse 11, it says, for, uh, yeah, verse 12, sorry. Therefore, lift your drooping hands and strengthen your weak knees. There are a lot of areas in our life that we need to uh, be physically strong, I think, for the race that God has before us. And in verse 13, it says, Make straight the path for your feet, so that what is lame may not be put out of joint, rather be healed. And so there's this concept that everything has to be in alignment, especially when you think about running. And so um, if I have running shoes that are not good, think about what that does. If my feet are crooked or they're out of alignment, then all of a sudden my ankles are a little bit off, just a little bit. But then my knees are a little bit more off and then my hips are even more off and that's going to mess up my back and it's going to mess up my neck and shoulders. And I'm just going to, I'm going to have a miserable run at best and at worst, I'm going to get injured. Like this is not going to be good. Make straight the path for your feet so that the lane may not be put out of joint, but rather be healed. If I'm in alignment and if I'm in alignment physically as I'm running, I'm going to have a good run. If I'm in alignment, a good physical and spiritual alignment for the race that the Lord has me to run, I am going to run well. And this is like, this is like more than just training on some flat straight course for a run. This is about all of the other muscles and things that we have to use when we're running. And when we think about people running on this course, like if all they train was to run from there to there and back, they're only going to be trained to run from there to there and back. But when you start to think about the other things that they have to train for, so they have to be, be ready to run around that pole. And so they have to train different muscles so, because they're going to be turning and uh, pivoting and they have to have different muscles and stretching going on there. They have to probably have upper body strength because they're going to be battling these other guys as they're running around that pole and they want to be able to shove them out of the way. And then they have to have a different set of like muscles developed in their, in their lower leg because the sand, which which is nice and smooth when they start the race. Now you get a bunch of people running uh, back on it. Now it's just going to be a different texture on that sand. It's going to be different movements uh, that their body's going to be uh, asked to do. And so as believers, as followers of Jesus, in order to run our race with endurance, we have to be well-rounded in our spiritual strength. We have to be well-rounded in our physical strength because it takes a lot of muscles and it's going to take a lot of endurance. And if we just exercise the one muscle, our other muscles are going to get tired. And if our other muscles are tired, our, our knees will be weak, our hands will be droopy like we read in verse 12. So we need to be strong all the way around, ready to run this race with endurance. Verse 14 gives us some insight into this. It says, Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. And then in verse 15, we'll just read that. It says, See to it that no one fails to obtain the grace of God, that no quote-unquote root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. In verse 16, it says that also that no one is sexually immoral or unholy like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. There's this collection of uh, attributes that I think the writer is saying, all right, You've got physical endurance, you have physical fitness, but there's kind of like this spiritual endurance and there's these spiritual things that you want to avoid because in order to be spiritually strong as an individual and spiritually strong as a body of believers, because remember, once we're following Christ, we're also in a body of believers, I want you to be aware of these things. So 
we, we want to strive for peace and righteousness, peace in our lives because we want to be able to keep our mind focused on the race at hand and righteousness. We want to live holy lives. And Nelson gives the three things that support these two, that support peace and righteousness. And what they are is, number one, is sexual immorality. Sexual immorality if, if it is allowed into your life, it creates guilt, it creates shame, it creates disrespect. You're partnering with sin and darkness. You want to bring that into a body of believers? No way. Like, you don't want to bring that in. And also, consider what it does to you in your spiritual walk and the endurance that you have. Like, if you're living an unholy life in that regard, you're opening yourself up to a bunch of stuff and you are not having your eyes fixed on Jesus because if you did, you wouldn't be doing that. Number two is falling short of God's grace. We, we, we talk about this in the verse, but like, don't live under condemnation and the weight of the law. We just spent all these chapters trying to get away from the law and the Old Testament into the new covenant <clears throat> and following Jesus and living a life where our eyes are fixed on Jesus. If, if we don't allow God's grace to permeate our lives so that we can walk out what he has for us, we are just putting burden on ourselves. We have to uh, live underneath God's grace. And then the third one, so we have sexual immorality. We have got falling short of God's grace. And then the third one is a root of bitterness. Bitterness is like a disease. It's like an affection. It's, it festers and it creates spiritual disease in your life. If you're holding bitterness against somebody, you are not, you're, you're focused on them. Remember we talked about like if your head is turns to the left or to the right, you're no longer fixed on Jesus and you're looking at this like bitterness. It's allowing you to like get just all messed up about maybe somebody who did you wrong. And I actually believe, I uh, remember a couple days ago, uh, we talked about like, why, why would you want to forsake the assembly? Hebrews, Hebrews uh, chapter 10 says, don't forsake the assembly. Why would you want to forsake the assembly? I'll bet this is directly related to that, is that there, if there, there could have been a root of bitterness in this community that was causing them to not want to gather. Because I'll tell you what, I certainly don't want to gather with people who are bitter towards me. And, and when I've been bitter towards somebody else, I don't want to be around them. And so what the writer is saying here is get rid of that, shed that weight, shed that sin, get it out so that you can stay focused on the race ahead. You want to be at the top of your game. And in verse 17, it says, For you know that afterward, when he desired to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no change to, uh, chance to repent, though he sought it with tears. This is talking about Esau. Like, he, he just, he desired to inherit the blessing, but he was looking at something else. And he, it, it's just, it, it did not work out for him. And because of that, he wasn't ready to run the race with endurance. There's a lot to this, the sports analogy. And, you know, we still have another half a chapter that we haven't covered. Uh, I, I want to do hit the last two verses, Kevin, if we can go to verse 28, uh, just to try to put an end cap on this for the verses that we didn't cover. It says, Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Our God disciplines us so that we are ready to run the race that he has for us, so that we are ready to endure the spiritual and physical battle that lies before us, so we can keep our eyes fixed on Jesus because we set aside the old covenant. We are locked into Jesus. We have faith. We are walking by faith. And now we're ready to walk with Jesus through this. And he's getting us ready. And I hope that you are allowing him to discipline you and get you ready for the race that he has for you. Thank you for hanging out with us. Tomorrow, we're going to wrap up Hebrews chapter 13. It's going to be great. We'll see you then.